Welcome to the Provocateurs Podcast, enabling you to think differently about leadership. Hello, I'm Des Dearlove, and I'm the co-founder of Thinkers 50. I'd like to welcome you to our podcast series, Provocateurs, in which we explore the experiences, insights, and perspectives of inspiring leaders. Our aim is to provoke you to think and act differently <clears throat> through conversations with insightful leaders who offer new perspectives on traditional business thinking. This is a collaboration between Thinkers50 and Deloitte. And my co-host today is Jeff Tuff. Jeff is a principal at Deloitte where he holds leadership roles across the firm's sustainability, innovation and strategy practices. He's also the co-author, along with Steve Goldback, of Provoke, How Leaders Shape the Future by Overcoming Fatal Human Flaws. Jeff, welcome. Thanks, Des. It's great to be here. Um, I got to tell you, though, I'm nervous. You're I'm nervous because it's I'm nervous right, because we're, we're joined today by one of the most influential people in the world. So our guest today is Martin Lindstrom. Martin, welcome. Uh, Martin is the founder and chairman of Lindstrom Company. That's a global branding and culture transformation firm that operates, as I understand it, across five continents and more than 30 countries. Uh, he is one of the world's leading branding experts, and we'll hear a lot more about that today, uh, advising a variety of leading tech companies, including Uber, Google, and Gucci, uh, on innovation in Web 3.0. For the past decade or so, probably over a decade, he's been featured as one of the world's top business thinkers by the Thinkers 50 list. Uh, and Time Magazine, going back to my original statement, has named him as one of the world's 100 most influential people. So, Martin, it is an, honest, it is an honor to have you here. Jeff, I'm just as nervous as you are. So if you take those two and combine it, do you know what? It will neutralize everything. We're probably going to have a lot of fun instead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we we want to talk about this big experiment that you're involved in, uh, Engineering Our Dreams, a big project, <laughs> uh, largest metaverse experiment ever conducted. Uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about that. But I want to take you back into the mists of time. I want to take you back to when you were just a young lad because – you know, you, you had a very interesting start, a very entrepreneurial start. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the Lego story? Well, I was obsessed with Lego, I can tell you, so much so that I actually built my own Lego bed. Can you imagine? Now, I will not <laughs> recommend you to sleep in it, which I did, because you will have a lot of guts on the back of your back, which I had. And do you know what? I was so serious that I actually managed to um, get a sponsorship from Sony they flew me to Japan to learn how to cut bonsai trees. Can you believe it? Not sure how I did it. Um, and then I opened up my own theme park. I um, took about a year how, for me. How old are you at this point? How, this I was, is... At that stage, I was 11, right? I was okay. 11. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, kind of an over, it sounds like you're kind of an overachiever, Martin. <laughs> I was just crazy, a provocateur, you could say, right? But, but it got the attention of it got Lego's attention too, didn't it? It, 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 they... it did. Yeah, it did. I mean, I opened the doors to this Lego land, and only two people showed up, which were really, I think, the lowest point of my career. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my mom and my dad, right? Uh, so I went to the local print office, persuaded them to put an ad in the paper, and two days later, I had 131 visitors showing up. There's just one problem: visitor number 130. And visited them 131 with the lawyers from Lego suing me. Uh, they said it was their brand. I said, what's the brand? I bought the boxes. Now, the funny part of this story is, as you are indicating this, was in fact that the, the Lego management heard about that. And in fact, the owner of Lego, the late, um, one of the late founders of, or co-founders of the brand, actually took his little Fiat Poncho, I think it was, and drew to the village where I was born and raised. And uh, it was like God coming, visiting you, I can tell you. And uh, we did a deal, and the deal was I would get a, a job at Lego. So I was probably, and still am today, the long, youngest kid in history of Lego, working at Lego at the age of 12. Yeah. No, I just think it's such a fantastic story. And um, you know, it just goes to show, as I, as I was remarking earlier before we, we, we came on air, that, that you know, you, 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 were, you were sort of a, a troublemaker and an agitator right from the beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was. I'm so sorry, but I was. <laughs> so, Martin, I, I'm sure we'll, we'll get a bit more of a linear journey at some point. But tell us a little bit about how this entrepreneurial spirit that we heard about just in that and then that one anecdote, how that's kind of woven through your career and some of the experiences you've had along the way and how you've been a provocateur along those various different stages. I mean, I think one of the key things I've done, which may have been slightly better than than than, than the most, is that 
I was extremely focused from a very young age, as you can hear. So I actually, at that stage, started to focus on branding. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, there was a lot of amazing brand uh, experts out there. Um, but I wanted to be the best in the world. So I sort of said, well, listen, you can't go in and be the best in the world unless you sort of trick it a little bit. So I started to combine two ordinary things in a new way where brands always was one dimension and then something else was another dimension. And over the years that something else was first when the World Wide Web or the Internet was invented in 1994, where it became, actually I wrote the first book ever about how to build brands online. And then later on, I took children and brands. Then I took neuroscience and created a term called neuromarketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we took politics and created small data. All these different things were really two ordinary things combined in a new way. And you could almost see it as like a Venn diagram where you have branding in the center. And then you have all these different Venn diagram cycles around. And each of them had another twist to brands. Mm -hmm. And over time, you slowly, you know, I guess, uh, accumulate respect and credibility around the core versus brands. So this has always been my foundation. But I always also always thought if you want to own that space, you need to be highly provocative. Um, because else you won't get the attention. So over the years what I worked with is to come up with with crazy ideas. And and these ideas, all of them have had one thing in common, that is to make a point so extreme that people will never forget it. So, uh, Jeff, I have a feeling of you going to ask me about a couple of about a couple of answers or examples here, right? So I'm just thinking out loud here. Can I say, but before you jump into the examples of your career, Martin, I'm going to start with just a really basic question: What is a brand? What does oh, yeah. what does a brand mean? And then and then let and then let's move forward with your story. Yeah. Well, a brand is really not made in a factory; it's made in our minds, and you could create. You could basically say it's an emotional construct. It is an emotion you establish between a person and a factory in the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's um, increasing the value of a product or a service. Um, so brands are incredibly important. And what's really important to understand here, DFA, is that brands is everything. Brands is not just a product and service. It's also a person. You are brands. It can be a country. It can be a royal family. It can be a celebrity. So brands are really everything. And I think in the world we live in today, we're so self-aware that I think increasingly we're aware of how to build ourselves as brands. So brands is really just an emotional construct, right? Do you, would you say though, I mean, one way of thinking about it, and again, you, you, you're very, obviously very free to disagree with this, but it always seems to me that brand, a brand is also a promise. We, we expect when we see a brand, we, we think we've got a kind of a relationship with it if we understand it and we expect it to live up to its part of the bargain, whatever that might be, whatever that promise is. For example, and, and Lego is a great example of that. I mean, Lego, Lego, you know, they, they, that brand is is a very strong brand for a very good reason. Absolutely. I mean, it, you're spot on. In fact, you should you should get the job instead of me. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it is a promise, and in, in particular in the world we live in right now, that promise is increasingly important. But that promise is also having another flavor. Uh, today, if you take the younger generation, what they care about in particular is not greenwashing. And it's for a brand to have a purpose. And a purpose is part of that promise that you're not just buying a product for the sake of buying it and accumulating stuff. You're also doing it because you're making the world a greater place to live in or or just your life better with your friends. So you could say that that promise is changing flavor. In the past, it was very much a tangible, physical thing you could display. And now it's much more an emotion. It's like a guarantee where you actually are saying to the world, I'm an okay person and I actually believe in human mankind and the future, right? Right. So I've, I've actually, I want to go back to the stories you were going to tell. I've got some questions about what's to come in the future with brand, but I'll hold those for now. But tell us about some of the experiences you've had along the way and working with some of these brands. And I'm interested by your Venn diagram and the comment about how you always have an overlapping topic. If you just yeah. bring some of those to life. Well, it's a good question because I think what once you do is always to um, to create a counterintuitive statement because it makes you think, particularly in this very linear world we're living in right now. So if I want time back to 2008 where I wrote a book called Biology, B-U-Y-ology, it was where I introduced the term neuromarketing. Hmm. Um, one thing I, I realized when you are introducing such a controversial new term 
where we, by the way, conducted more than 2,000 scans of users' brains using fMRI. Mm -hmm. One thing I realized was incredibly important was to do something for the better. Um, so we actually recruited more than 2,000 smokers. My mom was a heavy smoker by then, and I was incredibly frustrated and concerned about uh, her 40 cigarettes or 50 cigarettes per day consumption patterns. Um, so that actually sparked my interest in neuroscience because I couldn't understand how do I make her stop smoking? She knows she's not healthy. She knows it's irritating for everyone around. It costs a fortune. You're not looking good doing it. Why? And it was very hard for me to understand as rational as I was for those five minutes. So uh, we conducted this study using fMRI. And we actually um, started to test the health uh, warnings on the cigarette packs. And what we learned to everyone's surprise was that the health warnings, you know, in the United States is called the Surgeon's General Warning. In the UK, uh, it's one of those nasty photos you get on the cigarette yeah. packs. But in the old days, we had to realize just with the text, it had the opposite effect. In fact, they encouraged smokers to smoke more, not less. And that was a, a profound insight, which, of course, was something we worked very hard on understanding. So as a consequence of that, we uh, started to understand what does it take to change this around and develop various methodologies around that, gave all that insight and studies to um, different science groups around the world and to governments. And today I'm proud of saying that um, the methodology we proposed and the visual language we proposed has now been adopted in more than 60 countries uh, oh, by governments and according to WHO, save more than a million people's lives. And I think what I'm saying here, besides doing a humble bragging, was... <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be humble. You can you can just brag. It's a, that's a great story. <laughs> well, yeah, except that my mom passed away from smoking. Oh, I'm um, sorry to hear that. No, yeah, me too, actually, because that was really that was really my driving force to do this. But if I should take that aside, which of course in its own right is very emotional, um, it is um, to do something dramatic. And there is a, a very interesting piece of our brain, an area which is called the somatic marker. It's, when something dramatic is happening in your life, it's mm -hmm. called a somatic marker. Mm -hmm. It is almost like, you know, when Socrates was teaching his students, whenever they said something really, really, you know, he said something really, really important, he would slap them on the chin at the same time. And they would wake <laughs> up you know, and they'll never forget it. Well, that slap on the chin is a somatic marker. And that's really what I've learned coming back to your question, Jeff. And that mm -hmm. is the provocateur. That is when you did this. When I did this cigarette stuff, um, it woke governments up around the world and created mm -hmm. attention around it. And that somatic marker is really what I'm always looking for because we live in a world right now where there's so much noise that you are not getting any attention at all. So if you want to create a new philosophy, a new statement, a new direction, you can only do it by provoking. So that's what I'm doing through these methodologies, right? Yeah, that, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm fascinated. At, well, I'm actually just fascinated by the whole concept of fMRI and what you can actually tell and whether you can get to some of the underlying reasons why people were smoking more when they saw those um, warnings, et cetera. But um, and so if you if you have a short answer to that, I'd love to hear it. But just generally recognizing you can't run marketing divisions or marketing companies by strapping a bunch of people up to an MRI machine. How do you know you're hitting the somatic marker now? when you're developing a new campaign or a new brand position or what have you? So those two very simple questions in one. Thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, let's see if we can answer that in a short way. Um, f first of all, um, the reason why it happened was really to the Pavlos effect. You know, the dogs, yeah, yeah. Where, you know, that whole story. Well, in fact, when you would link a piece of graphics with a certain feeling of lighting up a cigarette, you're getting the nucleus accumbens, which is the craving spot in the brain activated. Well, those two symbolics are linked together, like just like the Pablos and the dogs. Mm -hmm. um, so when I suddenly put on a health warning where it has a text on and the text uh, says uh, smoking kills, I'm actually not, not reading it. What I'm seeing instead is I'm seeing a symbol and those symbols are activating a craving in my brain. So that's the reason why those graphic designs did not work. And that's what we discovered through the fMRI study, right? Now, back to your, your, your second question. Well, how do you do this without fMRI? Well, it's a good question. 
Um, that's the reason why some years later I, I wrote another book called uh, Small Data. Mm. I define small data as seemingly insignificant observations you make in people's lives, which are leading to a huge or uh, profound change. And small data, quite often, I have to tell you, is just as powerful as, as neuroscience because it's a matter about observing things mm. and find a little minute, little thing in a, everyday life and then basically take that concept and evolve it into a solution. Um, so that you can do very cheaply, uh, and it's incredibly powerful. The challenge is that in our data-obsessed world today, where people love spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations, that uh, it's, it's not turning a lot of people on when you say you only had 24 respondents uh, in a study. Um, for some reason, our society is not believing it. But I can tell you, on the other hand, and if we have time, we can talk about how it works. But uh, time after time, some of the most powerful transformations of companies I've at least been involved with started with small data. So fMRI and neuroscience is powerful quite often to verify hypotheses, mm. but it needs to start with small data, which actually in its own right is even more powerful. Yeah, And, of course, small data is the title of one of your – again, another brilliant – you have a gift for, as well as, as well as being provocative, you have a gift for certain phrases. I love – Thank Biology you. is is one of my all time favorite book titles. Well, it's just genius. As is small data. At a time when everybody was talking about big data, and your book comes out small data, it's that it's that positioning yourself in a in, in a sort of contrarian point of view, which brings us in a certain way to the metaverse. Let's let's talk about this experiment that you're involved in. Tell us a little bit more. It's very intriguing. Well, listen, in 2004, um, when social media really kicked off with Facebook uh, as a leader, um, I think it's fair to say that that challenged bureaucracy. It uh, amplified the concept of uh, fake news. And it also, I would claim, destroyed the lives for a lot of young people. Mm. Now, if we were able to wind back time and redo this again, what question would we ask ourselves back mm. then? And uh, I thought a lot about that, I have to say. And the answer is I don't have an answer. But one thing I concluded out of this is that um, we probably could have simulated the future better. We mm. probably could have said, why don't we take certain dimensions of this and simulate it? And then maybe we couldn't answer all the questions, but then maybe we could have 20 or 30% of coverage. And this is really what we're doing now. So why do we do this now? Well, I'll give you some stats, which for me is, is profound. An average adult American is spending 10 and a half hours glued to a screen every day. That's 66% of your awakening hours. Generation C, or in European, Generation Z, uh, is spending 77% of the time in front of a screen. Mm -hmm. If I look at people, young, uh, young kids from the age of 7 to 10, they on average are spending time in front of not one screen, not two screens, but 2.4 screens on average in Northern Europe. Wow. Um, so it's not a question about if we are moving into a reality plus or a metaverse type of environment. Uh, it's just a question about when it's happening. And I think it's fair to say with the arrival of a reality plus, you know, launched by Apple uh, very soon, supposedly, with the augmented reality glasses and, of course, with artificial intelligence and chat GPT, uh, this is just on the breaking point to become something which is going to define our lives. And that is the stage why I said exactly what I did with uh, the cigarette smoking issue back in the days. I said, listen, this is, of course, on one hand, fascinating. On the other hand, this is probably fundamental going to change everyone's lives. Mm. And this is probably the last train leaving the station. So we better get our house in order. So over the last uh, 18 months at this stage, we've raised 22 million US dollars. Um, and conducted are right now conducting the largest uh, scientific study in the world where people are moving into a reality plus environment uh, for good. Mm. To understand multiple aspects, it's sponsored by 22 of the largest brands around. Um, and, and really what we're doing through this experiment is to understand different extreme scenarios of what is going on when we are exposed to augmented reality, virtual reality, of course, a chat GTP version not five or six but perhaps version 10 so we can now start to set a framework almost like a picket fence around how far this should go 
Mm. The outcome of our project has evolved a lot because there's so much attention around what we're doing right now with from governments around the world that we are very likely to see uh, a variation of PG-13, which you know very well, uh, Jeff, from, from the mm -hmm. United States, from the movie categorization. And we probably will develop now uh, a similar categorization for what we call digital content. Uh, so really what we're talking about here is that just like you have a, a health declaration on the back of food, you have a digital health declaration. And that will, just like when you eat potato chips and it has 120 calories in it and you know uh, one bag is probably enough, um, well, you will have the same on all digital content you are consuming, whether you're a child or an adult. Why? Because we now have, and this is extremely concerning, we now have evidence that the brain is developing almost to, the, to 90% by the age of seven. Yet, if you are altering the brain in terms of virtual reality or augmented reality, you create friendships with an avatar or through AI-driven avatars, then you literally are changing, with our, you're changing our personality and the chemistry balance in the brain, which is called neurotransmitters. So we are literally in the engineering rooms of destroying the next generation. And that is, for me, extremely concerning. And that's the reason why we literally are working with the who's who around the world on this project. And hopefully, you know what, hopefully I can pull it off, but it is, of course, um, an exhaustive, super exciting, but exhaustive challenge I set in front of myself here, right? So, so I have to say, Martin, this is the direction I wanted to go before when I said I've got some questions about the future and what that may bring. You're yeah. clearly someone who is a force for good and, and using brands or creating brands are, are, that are a force for good in the world. There are others who may actually have a different stance and maybe an opposite stance. Is, is there a danger in some ways that this knowledge that you're creating is used by the quote unquote bad guys. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of the impact of fake news, um, which we are subject to quite often here in the US, I'm sure uh, elsewhere around the world. What can we do to prevent the concept of brand being used in a negative way to influence opinions and influence behavior um, in any category? If you can't. I mean, let's be realistic. Uh, and I think, you know, when, when you talk to people with both the inventors of AI or virtual reality or augmented reality, they're all saying to me today when we have chats behind closed doors, do you know what? I'm surprised about how my content, my strategies, my algorithms have been used as a weapon against uh, human mankind. People are just not aware of it. Just think about the Manhattan Project, right? And um, I think the reality here is that what we have to do very quickly is to make populations uh, um, become aware of what the ramifications are. And I, I was just spending uh, time with the House of Lords in, in London two days ago to discuss this very topic because this is likely to become a law as well in the UK now, what we're doing. And I think what they said was you're doing the right thing by being extremely provocative. So one of our some of our experiments was still to be announced uh, in public but they are extremely provocative, but they're designed around creating a somatic marker so there is a shock. And then immediately thereafter, we are testing guiding principles to companies. So what we're doing here is that we're creating this pledge uh, uh, among the leading brands and companies around the world, which are basically saying we're buying into this way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And then we create kind of a peer pressure among chief executives around the world to buy into this. Now, Along with that, we're also working with educational systems around the world. So we work with both the education system out of the U.S. government, but also uh, with EU and out of the U.K., where we're creating almost like a food pyramid, but just a digital pyramid instead, where we're helping teachers to get a grip around this because they have no idea about how to handle this right now. And neither does the parents uh, for that sake. right? Mm. So that's the second thing we're doing. And, and then the third thing we're doing is, is, is of course, to go in and develop methodologies uh, in the gaming universe, for example, where things we know today is creating far too much addiction and literally is destroying the brain, that we create new tools which have a similar type of intrigue, but which are not destroying the, the neurotransmitter balance. And that is leading science we're talking about here, where we work with Harvard and MIT on this right now. So I'm trying to do my best, but I can tell you one thing. I'm pretty sure, just as the case has been with any of my previous books, that people are going to use it as a weapon. And I'll give you examples. I mean, for small data, I had multiple governments reaching out to us and say, how do we use small data in the way we are setting policies? For, for biology, 
um, you know, we've been contacted by, I mean, at least 20 different uh, politicians which wanted to use neuroscience to to make sure they would lead a, a, a race. Um, and of course, we're saying consistently no, but we also know they went somewhere else. Um, so you know what? I believe that if you can push this hard enough, get enough voice, you are five minutes ahead of everyone else. And that comes back to, I guess, my definition of the future, which I stole from John Peters, that you're only predicting the future by being five minutes ahead. And we're yep. trying to be five minutes ahead all the time, right? What can you tell us? You, you sort of hinted at some of the experiments. And I, I mean, you know, you, you and I have had conversations where you're talking about, I mean, what I found fascinating was the, the notion that what happens in the virtual world can, can have a physical impact on yeah. the human body, which is, which is, you know, seems, seems the wrong way around somehow, but I know that you're looking into some of those things, but and, and I appreciate that you can't necessarily tell us everything that you're, you're up to in your, in your lab, but can you give us some idea of some of the, some of the sorts of areas you're going to look at and so how that's going to play out? Oh, you're so diplomatic. I love your taste. You know, this, this, <laughs> this British way of navigating words, which I just, I'm so lost on that one. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I can give you some indications. We're looking into, at this stage, eight different industries. Uh, so we're looking into the B2B industry. Uh, and then you'll say, well, what the heck does it have to do with ethics? Well, I don't need to tell you that if your boss in the future is going to be an algorithm, uh, well, then suddenly the ethical relationship with who you're dealing with is going to be very, very different. And this, by the way, is happening already. If uh, you're gamifying the way we work today, uh, people are getting exhausted, and I don't need to tell you that certain uh, rideshare companies gamified the way um, you basically were hiring um, a driver or the way they were driving, which meant that they were working into 20 or 24 hours a day without a break. So the ethical side on the B2B area is something which is very interesting. We're also looking into spaces like psychological safety, uh, Amy Edmondson is is has lent a, a helping hand of being interested and in, involved in our projects. Uh, you know her very well, I know. Um, but there we're looking into how do you create psychological safe environment to improve creativity in virtual uh, environments. So here we're working with some of the leading uh, authorities in the world on hologram designs. And I can tell you already now, I'm not sure if you tried hologram meetings. Um, of course, it's part of our daily work now. And it's crazy what's happening in those meetings because you literally feel the person is sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. So what we are measuring now is the brain waves as I sit in a hologram meeting to understand um, how do you decode signals which was disappearing on Zoom and Teams, but now with some presence. How do you decode that? And how does it impact our brain of feeling psychologically safe? How does it impact the brain when it comes to creativity to create alignment and by the way on diversity as well mm. because uh, people which are very introvert uh, don't say a lot but actually the most creative people according to our studies women are not necessarily as brash as some men are so their voice is not so prominent well that is timing it around when we do experiments using hologram so mm. this is the b2b space super fascinating and there we have some of the leading brands sponsoring this whole thing then we have on the b2c space uh, everything from uh, FMCGs and CPG brands. And this um, one example, which is a more or less a public experiment uh, we're doing right now on Red Bull, is to say, well, if I drink a Red Bull uh, in a physical space, you get energy. Now, we know today from all our flavor design experiments that around 50% of what you taste is actually not the taste, it is the environment. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, the reason why you probably hated coffee when you drank it the first time or hated a beer the first time, uh, but like it now is because you actually, when you drink it again and again, it's reinforcing your brain to understand that you are an adult. So you actually are drinking it to become mm -hmm. an adult and you feel that. And that reinforcement certainly is tuning your taste preferences around. So in the Red Bull case, we're looking into the perceived value of energy um, and tapping into the next generation of placebo. So we have one of the leading experts on placebo working on this experiment. And what we are now introducing is a whole new term, which we call the metasebo effect. And metasebo effect is literally when you drink a virtual Red Bull, you're actually getting more energy physically, um, which sounds crazy, but which mm. we actually have evidence for now. 
And that is where this starts to be very intriguing and very thought provoking because we can now see that even though you may not spend time in a virtual environment, uh, other people who do would actually change their brain structures if they spend time there and, ch and change their physical appearance later on in a very subtle way. Our brains will literally rewire. And that is, of course, what we are interested in understanding because that will impact the next generation and the DNA coding, right? This, uh, I have to say, this is fascinating. I don't know if I'm really excited or really scared, but I have concluded two things. Number one, I now understand why you've been named one of the most influential people in the world. And number thank two, you. I'm going to feel a lot better next time I have a beer. So thank you for that. <laughs> I, uh, so uh, Des named a couple of your books that he, uh, he liked the titles of. I got to say my favorite is, um, if I've got this right, The Ministry of Common Sense, uh, which I think is your most recent book with a subtitle of how to eliminate bureaucratic red tape, bad excuses and corporate bullshit, which I love. And I think you and I probably think very similarly. That's uh, um, got some tones of some of the books that Steve and I have, have written. But can you tell us a little bit about that book and where it came from, what it's intended to do beyond the the obvious uh, uh, subtitle that, that it's encouraging? Absolutely. I mean, um, many years ago, I was asked by Charlie Bell was with a former 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 CEO of McDonald's to reinvent the Happy Meal. Hmm. And I said to Charlie, I would love to do that if I can make it healthy. Charlie was a good man. Uh, so uh, he said yes. And we started to develop the new uh, Happy Meal design. And we really, again, used the power of storytelling and perception and placebo. So we converted the bushes in the forest was the broccoli and the cucumber was the murder weapon and the tomato was the blood. And then we created this amazing Shrek mm. type of, of narrative. Um, and as we launched it as a pilot in Germany, it was a huge success. The parents loved it. Kids ate broccoli at the age of six. Can you believe it? And, and even the franchisees really liked it. So I thought with myself, this is a home run. So I went to the headquarter of McDonald's outside Chicago. And I'll never forget it because they said to me, this is interesting. Jeff, what does that mean when people say interesting? In thanks, your Martin Seal. Yeah, thanks, Martin Seal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was European, so I thought, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think it's interesting, right? So um, I was waiting for two years, and we were waiting for the big launch of this new Happy Meal. And guess what? It was the useless suspect, a sugar bun, the meat inside, mm. uh, the toy, and this time it had sliced apples in a little plastic bag. Mm. And that's really where I learned about uh, what we call bureaucracy or what I call an immune system, a defense mechanism for change. Uh, we're petrified of changing. And mm -hmm. in this case with McDonald's, they have two main toy suppliers, the biggest in the world, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, which is a product place or um, a private label manufacturing uh, setup. So they were addicted to a certain way of, of working. And I, of course, asked myself, what the heck did I do wrong? What could I have mm -hmm. done differently? So for over two years, we worked with psychologists joining me for every single meeting to understand dynamics in rooms. And out of that, we started to change the way we work with companies and brands and organizations to understand the dynamics between people and how you make decisions happen in a very tangible way. And you could say in many ways the outcome of that became uh, the result of the Ministry of Common Sense, which laid on. Uh, was named not by me, but by a lovely lady in the UK, which we worked with on Standard Charter Bank, where we had to turn around the bank. And uh, she came up with that title mm. at, very late at night and said, you know what, everything is rubbish here. Let's create a ministry. And today the Ministry of Common Sense is up and thriving, uh, running very well at, at Standard Charter Bank. And they've cleared up hundreds and thousands of stupidities so really, it's a way to clear out stupidities in organizations and make things happen. That's fantastic. And and kudos to whoever came up with that title. I love it. Mm -hmm. I am interested trying to link that, um, the notion of the work you're doing in the corporate space with some of the branding work and the, and the idea of a somatic marker. Is there a corporate equivalent of a somatic marker that any of our listeners who are executives themselves should be on the lookout for or should be triggering to make sure that they can move past the bureaucracy and cut the red tape? Well, yeah, I probably would say that the, the number one thing you should be very aware of is what I call the chicken cage syndrome. Mm -hmm. So some years ago, there was an experiment done with chickens. They're put into a cage for half a year, and one day they're let out on the beautiful green grass where the sun was shining and the birds were singing. 
And guess what? The chickens went out, and after 30 seconds, they went straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. And what I think I've learned um, working with and dealing with uh, chicken cages around the world, which I'm sure, Jeff, you've seen in the thousands in your work, mm. is a way to break it down. And, and, and this is where the trick happens. We live and we operate in a world which is, uh, I would say, ruled ruled by quarterly announcement earnings because of Wall Street and the street in general. We don't have any patience anymore, and, and I think you can see that with various companies. So um, what happens here is that that in lack of patience has to be waved into the system. And the best way of illustrating that comes back to this part two of the chicken cage story, because if you really want to have a chicken leaving the chicken cage, don't put a piece of corn far away from the cage, but actually leave it just outside the cage so the chicken can eat it. And the other chickens are looking at it and saying, wow, that's a successful. And then there's another piece of corn, another piece of corn, and it gives you, uh, or gets you to the end goal. Hmm. Those pieces of small bite-sized success stories is what I call a 90-day intervention. Hmm. And 90-day interventions is really to break down stuff. It's a little bit what Henry Ford said once, nothing is too difficult if you break it down to smaller steps. Hmm. Well, that's really what we're doing here. And I've learned that you increasingly have to be even more micro-focused on the smaller steps. They all have to link to a behavioral change in the organization, which, by the way, always should measure. measure, Because if you don't do that, you just can't convince the immune system to buy into it. And then you create a movement, one person at a time, in this case, one chicken at a time, but you create a movement, which then becomes a change. And this is really, I think, the best way to deal with change strategies in organization. At least that's my experience. Jeff, I'm sure you have tons of other uh, amazing suggestions to what to do, but at least in my little world, that's what I've learned is working well, right? Yeah, love it. Yeah. I've just noticed how orderly your bookcase is, Martin, and, and, I, and I glance over my shoulder and see what a mess man is. I wonder if that's representative of what's going on in our minds. That's all <laughs> slightly, slightly scary. But I'm going to take a chance here because the last time I saw you, we were at MIT and we were, we were doing a panel discussion. Actually, we were talking, yeah. we were talking about fake news. And I, thinking I, I wanted to end on a high, on a kind of a, an upbeat mm-hmm. thing, I, I asked everybody on the panel whether they were optimistic about the future. And, of course, it got to you. Because the other two had said they were, they were, you you did that contrarian thing where you said oh, I'm not. So that kind of, and then I wish I hadn't asked you. But I'm going to ask you again because you you have an opportunity here. Some of the things you've been talking about are are very hopeful. Yeah. About changing the world. Yeah. And so I, you know, I'm, I am going to put the question to you again. Are you are you optimistic? Do you think we can turn this thing? around? How many minutes do I have for this answer? <laughs> as many as you need. As many as you want, as long as you land in the place Des wants you to, I think, is the, is the answer, Martin. <laughs> um, do you know what I'm optimistic about? I'm optimistic about, so for example, we do experiments with Dr. Brennan Spiegel out of Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles right now, which is where you basically can heal people or remove pain through um, mental uh, virtual reality. Extremely uh, powerful stuff. We today can see that if you're using technology right, you can build up a sense of empathy uh, with people. Uh, we're doing other experiments where we clearly can see that uh, we actually can change um, people's music taste and make them become more happy every day by priming people through other means. We're doing so much stuff, which I think uh, is for the better. Um, we're also seeing, uh, sadly, there's a lot of uh, less positive stuff going up there. And I have to say to you that I was just on a call with, with your friend, Marshall Goldsmith, yesterday. Marshall and I are in contact every week. And Marshall said to me yesterday, Martin, for the first time in all these years we've known each other, I have to I have to coach you. And he said to me, Martin, don't be so doom and gloom about the future because you know, there's always a good with the bad. Uh, I'm still going to go against Marshall's <laughs> view and say, no, I'm not positive about the future. But I have to say, I'm positive about two other aspects. I'm positive by the fact that certainly the experiments we're doing and the outcome of some of the solutions are remarkable. And they are without any doubt when you hear about them a year or two from now, depending on when the various stuff is released, you're going to say, I never thought that in my entire life. Um, so that's a good side. Um, the the other side I'm positive about is the fact that I think we have enough attention by policymakers around the world. 
by governments around the world to introduce a, a new version of PG-13. And uh, I was very surprised by that. I mean, we spent a whole day in the parliament the other day to discuss with all the policymakers around this. And that is exactly what's happening in the White House, exactly what we're seeing in the EU and Brussels. So I'm so pleased about that they're welcoming our thoughts and we can impact that. So that's on the positive news. So my answer is probably it's more negative than positive, but it's not necessarily just doom and gloom. Okay, you're, you're, you, you, you were going so well, and I'm, and I'm, in, I'm in the same <laughs> camp as Marshall Goldsmith. I can't always say that, but I am. I am on this particular thing. I think, I think positivity has a certain power. Yeah, Jeff, you must see a lot. I'm just going to finish with you as well, because you must see a lot of the technology trends and things playing out with, with clients. I mean, are you optimistic? Do you, do you, does it fill you with hope? I mean, you, you said earlier that you're not sure whether you're frightened or, or, or you know, inspired, really, and I, I feel that too. Yeah, so I, so I know I know the answer I have to give on this, Des, um, but it is a natural answer, and I and I, I do feel positive, not necessarily just because of technology. And actually, I wanted to take Martin in this direction as well, but because what I've seen humans be able to do in the face of really gnarly problems. So, Des, as you know, I do a lot of work in energy and and sustainability uh, these days, and um, you know our push to decarbonize big, dirty value chains is a really gnarly problem. And in some ways, we could sit back and, and watch to see what might happen and when the right technology might come along to allow us to do that. But what I'm starting to see, in part due to new policies uh, being put into the um, into the corporate world from governments around the world, is people are trying things. They're taking those small steps that Martin talked about and starting to make progress. We're not inventing clean hydrogen in one fell swoop. We're not suddenly installing massive capacity of wind and solar in one fell swoop, but we are taking small steps and demonstrating, even without immediate economic payback, that we can do things and solve gnarly problems. And so that that I, so yes, I am optimistic. That's just see, just given what I'm seeing on the ground, and part of it is enabled by technology. But that actually is the a question I wanted to ask you, Martin. Not necessarily just to do with energy, but if you had to offer a word of encouragement to the world, to our listeners who day in day out deal with some small problems, but also gnarly problems, what's the one piece of advice you would have? for anyone out there to keep in mind, the equivalent of the Socratic slap on the chin? Uh, I think my answer uh, would be that I think you have to look at yourself with a different agenda. Mm -hmm. Today in our world, we have one bank account. You know, you receive your salary. I believe in the future we should have perhaps three, perhaps five bank accounts. One additional bank account will be your personal brand, right? Uh, one personal brave, one personal bank account for me would be what you learn and how you constantly are learning and it becomes part of the value you're getting out of your daily lives. And maybe you should have a fourth bank account, uh, which is how much change do you make in the world which are leading to, um, to, to something for the better. I don't think we allow ourselves to think about those things. There's all sorts of different studies showing that the more you give, the happier you are. That's not built into today's metrics somehow. Mm. Uh, so I would say for, for many of the leaders out there, try to think about your bank account in a different way and ask yourself, how can you fill some of the other buckets? Now, this is not something I'm just making up. We know from all sorts of different science now that the more you actually learn, the longer you live. I mean, uh, in, in the populations around the world, those people which are cheating uh, the most are the ones living the longest. Mm. Those people which are most social and helping other people look at studies coming out of Italy are the longest living people on planet Earth. And by the way, if you have your personal brand, you also feel safer because maybe you are fired, but you always have a safety net, which is your brand. Mm -hmm. So my advice to leaders out there is to think about those dimensions. That will help you to build a culture which is stronger, right? It will help you to be a better boss, I would also claim. And do you know what? I think it will be helping you to become a better husband or better wife. So uh, that's probably my, my advice. I know it's not exactly what you're looking for, but no, I think it, 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 it is. Yeah, it is. I, lo I love that answer. And I think you also gave someone a great business idea to go and invent the, uh, the multiple pocket bank accounts. Yeah, yeah. it will. It would be um, it would be fantastic. Well, we could talk about this stuff for hours. I, I think it's always the same when I, when I get together with you, Martin. But that yeah. is all we have time for. So huge thanks to our guest, Martin Lindstrom. And to you for listening. This is the Provocateurs podcast. And we've been Des Dearlove and Jeff Tuff. Please join us again soon for another episode of Provocateurs. <laughs>